Okay. So the goal the goal of this session was um, to come up today and use this slot in the group uh, to discuss a bit how we can start working together on a, on a sort of like reference architecture for for research and science scientific workloads and the stack that people are using and and maybe come up with like a suggested stack for the different kind of use cases we want to support and um, um, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen it uh, before but we have had this uh, similar idea in the past which is uh, I'm gonna try to find it Oops. and I'll share the link So if you find, uh, I'll, I'm sharing the link in the in the chat, and we had this uh, in in the in maybe I, I share the screen as well. Probably easier. Yeah. So we had this uh, this items in the past, which was. Uh, Basically, a similar idea. Uh, this was a long time ago, but uh, the idea was uh, to have for each area uh, that we wanted to do to have a, sort of an expansion of uh, um, how we could document for the different kinds of uh, use cases, uh, the different options, what people are using, uh, why they chose some tools versus others. Uh, there were, there were quite a lot. It was quite ambitious at the time, so I think uh, we probably have to go a bit uh, uh, more uh, like realistic, maybe. But uh, the, the idea was this this sort of like workbook uh, that we can expand maybe to, to more of a reference architecture style. Um, I think Brian, you mentioned that you you could maybe uh, start uh, drafting something. Uh, perhaps I have a I have some, two questions about yeah, um, yeah. what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, but I'm certainly willing to help out in this endeavor. So. Yeah. So I, I think if we can come up today with a sort of list of questions that uh, could be helpful to circulate with a few of us, uh, so that we start collecting the information. And then from that sort of like survey or similar, we could um, we could maybe uh, go into into starting to write a, a more structured way uh, of, uh, of documenting this. I'm just trying to find the previous uh, previous link I had here. I will find. Yeah. Yeah. So just give me a second. Right. So I'll share I'll share a link here that has um Okay, so this is uh, a link that maybe has something, which is, uh, I put it in the chat. Um, it has a few, a few examples that could be useful to build like a, a kind of, kind of a case study. But I think what we probably want is, is uh, a bit beyond that. Uh, so here, uh, maybe I share it. Yeah. 
So here we have things like describe your organization, uh, an overview of the architecture, and especially what are the goals that this is trying to serve. Um, and, and this is because even in the research community, like if you have, uh, we will have a lot of domains and different things people are trying to do with, uh, with this type of platforms. Um, the why people chose those projects. Um, and this is something that I think would be really useful in addition to have just a list of projects being used to have some context of why this project was chosen versus another in case people actually did an evaluation. Maybe like the typical case would be things like storage where maybe uh, people are interested in like high throughput or in some cases they're interested more in reliability and what it, this implies. And things that have worked well, what has not worked well, uh, any kind of glue components that were needed to make things work. And then also like some history uh, from, from previous attempts and what people are looking at. But uh, I think we can go quite a lot in detail uh, in this brief overview. We can probably get it quite a bit more expanded with some details. I don't know how people feel about this. Seems like a, a good start to collecting some information and finding some commonalities. And it's always useful to see the pitfalls, especially that people have run into in building their platforms. Yeah. Do you think this is realistic? Like uh, one, one question I had is uh, how how possible is it for people to actually be uh, quite detailed on this and open? Uh, like for, for my organization, this is quite easy. I know for other organizations, sometimes it's a bit more complicated. Um, well, it can be easy for the SKA as well. But I mean, what, what sort of turnover would you expect in terms of keeping this up to date? Is this, you know, it's slowly changing information. People would need yeah. to probably update it every six months or so. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Uh, we would probably have to put like a sort of uh, um, expiration date for, for all this kind of information and then maybe ping people to update them. I saw Alan, you came off mute as well. Yeah, I, I think this looks great. Is this just an example? Are there other, have other organizations filled this out or is this just kind of a first attempt at it? This is just a, like a random, uh, suggestion of what we could use as a, a template for people to fill out. Yeah, I mean, if this was the level of detail that everybody put in, that would be um, fantastic. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe maybe on a more practical question, uh, for because there, there are many areas, like I think describing the architecture and the goals, uh, everyone will kind of uh, be able to like produce a diagram and then maybe go a bit more in detail on different areas and describe the target use cases. Uh, I think the second question, which is this, can you expand on why you are using those project services? Uh, the goal here was about um, getting the, um, the context on why something was chosen over the other and help other end users that will have to go through choosing between, I don't know, three different options and maybe like speeding up this process. And like, if you have clearly this use case, maybe this is the best option. Now, this is kind of like controversial because you know, every use case will be slightly different, but is, it, is this something that you would be able to provide uh, input on? Uh, is this something that you've been go through in the past, for example, choosing the CNI you're using or choosing, I don't know, some, some like the best tool for, for um, uh, runtime security or similar things? Uh, well, in the astronomy community, we're all pretty open about um, sharing our, our um, current state and working together collaboratively to try to build something. So from our end, and I'll echo what Pierce said, that we have no problem um, disclosing what we're using and the decisions behind that. Okay. 
same here. Um, the, we work on an open source platform, and so everything's out there anyway. So. Yeah, I, th I think that's very good to hear because I think in this group we are probably in a particularly good um, uh, community set of communities where we can actually be pretty open about this this thing. So we, we can produce quite lots quite a lot of useful data. Is it worth just quickly introducing ourselves and why we're interested in this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We can do the round. Do you want to start, Matt? Yeah, I can do. Uh, so I work for a company called Stack HPC. Um, we build high performance clouds and we help people run platforms on top of those uh, like Kubernetes, Jupyter Hub, but also things like Slurm and just developer workstations and things that don't necessarily need a Kubernetes cluster. So um, we've developed a, a system called Azimuth that is, helps to simplify doing that on top of the OpenStack clouds that we run. Um, we're looking to diversify that into public cloud as well. Uh, our stacks, cluster, our Kubernetes stacks, cluster API, um, Calico, um, whole bunch of add-ons that we run. So we run like the standard Kube Prometheus stack and things like that for uh, for monitoring and uh, Loki, Loki and Promtail um, for log aggregation. So, um, and we also have a bunch of things that we do with um, high performance networking in particular. So we've been quite interested in SROV and Mac VLAN and um, getting the Maltus stuff working nicely in our setup. So we've managed, we've been doing S, we've been doing RDMA from pod to pod in, in VMs on an OpenStack cloud. So, um, and it works nicely. Um, so that's kind of where we're coming from. Um, so yeah, happy to happy to contribute wherever wherever is useful. That sounds awesome. Lots of uh, detail that I would be very keen on hearing more about. So uh, maybe Gabriel, do you want to go next? I see Gabriel, but okay. Maybe we go to Alan. You can go next, and then we come back to Gabriel. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Alan. I was you know, previously at Cray and HPE, working in uh, high performance computing. Uh, now I'm at SCADMD, working with Slurm, and their efforts to do Slurm in Kubernetes. Um, kind of calling it Slinky. Um, so we're looking at sort of the user workflows for how people might best use that. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's where I'm coming from. Excellent. Thank hey, you. sorry about that. Oh hey, yeah, go ahead, Gabriel. The little uh, the little green icon on the left was covering the microphone button, so it kept pulling up. I don't know storage preferences every time I clicked on it. But anyway, um, looks like I've got through that. So yeah, my name's uh, Gabriel Tossi. You guys can call me Gabe. I'm brand new to this group. I just joined because I'm interested in research computing and Kubernetes. I'm not sure where I caught wind of it, but I'm definitely interested in, in research computing and the application of Kubernetes to it. Uh, so it felt like a good fit. So what do I do right now? My current day job is a higher ed consultant for a company called Strata Information Group out of California. And we, uh, well, we coin ourselves as a leading higher ed consultancy in, in, in the world. But um, what I specifically do is implement uh, cloud technologies, including Kubernetes, for mostly enterprise systems in higher ed. But we have seen uh, an increase in the demand for research computing workloads in the cloud. So I'm just interested to hear more about you know, what what technologies you guys are using or you're seeing uh, to help implement research computing workloads and if any of those could be beneficial to our clients. Excellent. Yep. 
Thank you. I think next, uh, if I look at the order here, Jonathan. So I'm I'm with NERSC at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I've I've lurked around this group for quite some time. I I'm particularly interested in this um, reference architecture because it is something that we've been tracking and theoretically um, postulating different ideas with respect to how we would want to architect our NERSC 10 system, which is uh, planned to arrive in the 20, uh, 20, sorry, 2027 timeframe. And that um, we want to, one of the architectural goals of that system is to merge um, the separate resources that are for kind of the cloud and service, service oriented um, uh, aspects of the, the center into the platform for the HPC sort of high throughput and, and um, uh, large scale jobs. So before those resources are separated, uh, you have, we, we run Rancher for our, our, our Kubernetes stack that offers the user self-serve uh, platform for standing up uh, uh, services. We want to kind of compress that all into a, a platform where you'd have otherwise the logins for the HPC platform and the data transfer nodes all into the same infrastructure and tightly couple that in with the high, high speed fabric and access to the the, um, the scratch storage and other other storage components that are right now kind of separated from that that resource where the where rancher is running and the services are probably provided to the user. So thinking about like the network components and um, uh, yeah, the, the the virtual layers on top, the CNI that is used are, is particularly important. And I'm interested to see diagrams. So beyond what um, uh, uh, was was shown here in this uh, you know, run through of, of putting in details regarding the, the stack, it would be interesting to see also how the, the network architecture and, and the components are, if people are willing to, yep. to together something like that. Yeah, I, I think it, it's maybe maybe building quickly on that. Uh, we, we, we could also make these living documents and like, I'm sure like from the first version, a lot of us will have additional questions and uh, requests for details. Like the networking stack is obviously like something that will be quite specific depending on the workloads you're handling. So um, yeah, I think uh, maybe maybe when we start filling this in, uh, we we share them as soon as possible so that others can jump in and and, and try to ask for clarification. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And I think next would be Brian. Hi there, uh, I'm Brian Major from the Canadian Astronomy Data Center, which is part of the National Research Council Canada. Um, we uh, develop and operate a uh, science platform for astronomy um, called uh, CANFAR. Um, we um, actually uh, work collaboratively with the national infrastructure provider here um, the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. They're the ones that provide us a, a Kubernetes cluster with the queue installed on it. And we develop the applications that sit on top of that to uh, offer astronomers interactive and batch session handling um, to do uh, high throughput computing and analysis. Um, <clears throat> I've prepared a few slides. I don't know if we're going to get to that today or not, but if you'd like me to do that, I'd be happy to just spend five minutes going over this system. Um, I realize I'm probably sitting at a slightly different level than the others in this room, where we're actually the, one of the users of the uh, Kubernetes systems that are provided to us, and we interact directly with the researchers to define their workflows and, and things like this. So maybe slightly um, different layer, um, but I'm also very interested in everything that comes out of this as we're looking forward to evolving CANFAR and our technology stack to uh, to meet the, what's coming in the future and keep up to date on top of everything. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, like I'm, I'm fine, like we, we do a couple more introductions and then uh, we can either, uh, I, I would say we go through your slides and, and we see also how this fits to this, uh, this uh, proposal for the questions, initial questions. Uh, Piers, do you wanna go next? Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Piers Harding. I work for the SKA, um, based in, in the UK at the Jodrell Bank headquarters. Um, we uh, basically right at the beginning um, in the sense that um, the SKA is a 
NGO that's only really been alive for a couple of years. Um, and we're in the rapid uh, build out phase uh, for the project. So a lot of it um, is going into basically putting um, antennas on the ground and dishes out in the desert and so on. Um, but at the same time, we're building a lot of software for the control system and the science data processing um, within, you know, within the back end of the of the telescope. And so this gets us a lot of different environments and, and um, profiles of applications that we have to um, write, deploy, manage, and so on. So you can have a control system. Um, but you also have, you know, it's essentially batch processing, high performance batch processing that you have to do as well, um, as well as maintain um, a fairly big fleet for all of the developers that we have that are contributing around the world. So we have quite a large platform alone dedicated um, to the CICD infrastructure pipeline and so on um, behind those developers. Um, so we have spent quite a bit of time because we don't have many people and not many resources, um, in terms of people resources, at least, um, we spent a lot of time on trying to keep the platform as vanilla and agile as possible so that we can keep moving it forward. So we can keep iterating through upgrades and actually, you know, make, um, you know, keep it up so that we can take advantage of basically anything new that comes along um, if, if we decide we want to make a bet on it. So we just use a lot of the standard things. So we look, use Rook, we use Calico, um, although, you know, we may move to Celium. Um, there's a bit of a bit of a case for that coming out, but we do a lot of integration with FPGAs and, and GPUs as well. We use Maltus um for, for pushing various network interfaces directly into pods and, and so on um for high performance data receive um processing for instance um and you know things like metal lb so you know in particular we have quite a dynamic environment um where we have to expose services to the outside world so we make great use of um dynamic DNS integration with the cluster plus things like um, metal LB in order to make it easy for our developers and users to get access to um, the things that they build and set up and tear down on a, on a regular basis. Um, so yeah, it's, it's early days, um, but you know, we're accruing data centers like mad. So we, you know, we now have um you know six major um if not small data centers scattered around the world and those will keep proliferating as as parts of the um of the telescope infrastructure get rolled out cool yeah that's i, I think we're already hearing like quite quite divergent quite div diverse set of uh, stacks so it'll be really interesting to to, to look at this data later okay i i can i can fi finalize i think we covered everyone yeah. so I'll, I'll i'll cover uh my part so uh i'm ricardo i work at cern uh at cern we we've been using kubernetes for different kinds of things for a few years now um, actually, the original goal was to run, um, to experiment how we could run as uh, part of our batch systems uh, using Kubernetes. But uh, back in the days, uh, some basic primitives were clearly missing, uh, advanced scheduling, uh, queues, things like this. So we've been advocating for, for this kind of uh, use cases on, on Kubernetes for a long time. We also had some issues on even better performance of the scheduler, things like this. Things have improved very significantly, so we started expanding the number of use cases we cover. Uh, we also run a lot of the campus services uh, to support our community, and we have like 10,000 people working here, but uh, many more that have access to certain resources from elsewhere. 
So those are actually quite interesting to scale. And then for the scientific use cases, I mentioned batch, but we have the machine learning platforms also running on, on this kind of uh, infrastructure. So this is where things like uh, um, um, like efficient access to things like GPU resources is something that is very important for us. Um, also things like uh, um, for the HPC use cases, uh, which are not the biggest ones here, but uh, things that uh, low latency connectivity, support for uh, um, InfiniBand, Rocky, things like this. And then we have other use cases which are very specific to what we call online computing, which are the uh, control systems for the accelerators that are doing a transition to be fully containerized uh, uh, in a couple of years. And the same is true for the experiments that are uh, underground, where what was traditionally CPU farms using uh, bare metal or virtualization are also transitioning to have like large Kubernetes cluster where we can all change the, the workloads that are running there with more flexibility. Uh, in some cases, we these clusters can be a couple of thousand nodes. I think the largest one we have planned, single cluster is something like 5,000 nodes. So also scaling Kubernetes on itself is kind of a challenge. And I see, Alan, you have a hand raised. Yeah, I so I had been doing some research into you know how people set up login nodes or do even ephemeral login node type environments. And I had come across a presentation from CERN using container SSH. Mm -hmm. Is that still technology you all use there? Is that working well or? How, so th these are, this are, I would say this isn't the next part of our experience. Uh, uh, we, we, we have this goal, especially for GPU workloads to have a more flexible way to share different types of workloads in a central pool so that we make the best use of these GPUs. And um, traditionally, like if we talk machine learning, this will be like distributed training, inference, and some sort of interactive access using notebooks. But we have a lot of people that uh, prefer to have uh, SSH access. And this is where uh, we've deployed uh, container SSH. Uh, it is not in production. We have it in, uh, in uh, test deployments right now. OK. And those instances are those? containers in Kubernetes or are yep. they just, okay, there. Yeah, so basically it's a single cluster that uh, is serving different entry points. So it can be like notebooks or it can be SSH or it can be like batch kind of uh, cute uh, workloads. Yeah, this is, uh, we had a presentation in this working group about container SSH uh, a couple months ago. And uh, we actually have one of the maintainers of container SSH working here at CERN, so that helps as well. OK, well, I, interesting. I think I had, maybe that was a couple. I can't remember if the presentation was a couple months ago or one or yeah. two years ago. Maybe I'm thinking of two different ones. I'll have to go back and check. Mm -hmm. sure. OK, there, there was one, yeah, if you go back to the, like if you search on YouTube, you will find the recording for the last one in this group. OK, thank you. All right, um, I think, uh, Brian, do you wanna go through your deck? Sure. Oh, <clears throat> sharing here. But in, in any case, what I would suggest, I will, I will take these questions, uh, create a shared Google Doc, uh, put it on the Slack channel and then people can start commenting on like adding items for the questionnaire, uh, maybe editing the description of what we would like to have uh, for each item uh, in the replies. And then we just circulate this uh, initially uh, so that we all start filling them up in, independently in different docs, but also circulate with other people that might be willing to contribute. Uh, I can also mention something in the next KubeCon in Salt Lake, there will be, uh, there's this new end user tab, technical advisory board in the CNCF. They are very interested in taking our initial input as a, a base for, for other domains after. Okay. Shall I go? Uh, I won't be too long, don't worry. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is CANFAR. 
the Canadian Advanced Network for uh, Astronomical. Uh, um, it's a very general purpose, what we call multi-wavelength in astronomy, which basically just means we serve many different te telescopes and use cases. So we're, we're not focusing on a specific um, type of uh, problem per se. We're trying to support all types of computing, uh, but it is all high throughput computing rather than HPC. Um, we found that it's been a very good model for Canadian astronomy. It's brought on the democratization of access to uh, computing and analysis. It's very simple to use. Um, uh, we've been operating our instance since 2020 uh, in production. We have about 300 active users at any given time. Uh, a modest uh, cluster at the moment, but with the SKA project that appears was talking about which we are involved in we're one of the what's called the science regional center nodes um, we we have uh, very big plans to increase and scale up uh, over the next 10 years um, so some of the design principles that we have tried to stick um, is that our our unit of software is uh, docker containers uh, and these are user contributed containers. And so normally we have the projects uh, have one or two people that maintain their software containers and push them to the Canfar platform and to the, the image registry. And then the rest of the researchers simply um, take advantage of that and launch these containers to do their work. And so you don't need to have um, thorough knowledge of building software or building containers to use the platform. You just need someone in the group. But I should also mention that they're all nearly all public and so groups benefit from each other's work as well by reusing um, software so in this end we don't really expose the are uh, the researchers to kubernetes itself there's a simplified api that they connect to but we also need to support tools that do connect directly to kubernetes such as as ray uh, uh, one um, defining factor is uh, well AAI is a critical uh, piece of our infrastructure and probably the most complicated. It's the thing you kind of have to get right in order to get this working. So to support these 300 users from different projects and from different identity providers, um, we, we have a layer on top of our Kubernetes system that handles the authentication and authorization, which connects to the different IDPs that we support. Uh, this is also where the group information comes from and we use those groups for making authorization decisions. Uh, we we have focused on a sharing and self-service model. We ourselves are not a large group, so we try to put the onus on managing the resources and the permissions and the memberships of the projects onto the projects themselves. So uh, they will they will uh, be given groups to begin with, and they manage the members, they manage the containers, the permissions on those containers, and also the, their storage. Uh, we started initially with simply interactive sessions, so things like uh, Jupyter Lab. Um, CARTA is a astronomy-specific analysis tool, which is very popular, especially in radio astronomy. Um, VS Code for programming tasks and whatnot, and and basically anything browser-based that uh, is reasonably well written and connects to, you know. Uh, Web sockets and all that, all that stuff we can support in as long as they've been containerized in the proper way. Um, there's very few requirements on those containers, um, so it's pretty easy for people to build their own interactive sessions that they can then launch in Campfire as well. But we also have headless sessions, what we call, which are really batch jobs, and we have re recently introduced queue into our clusters to handle the queuing and fair sharing between uh, the tenants we have. Um, so. The user workload jobs do never run as root. In fact, they run as the user, and this is the IDP user from which they logged in. Then, as so, if you say you log in with York ID, you're going to be running your container as that user. And so, this this is a pretty tricky thing because uh, you have to manage the POSIX IDs from these different identity providers. And so, we're uh, currently working on we have a kind of a local solution for this, which we call POSIX Mapper, which maps these Unix layer level users to the IDP users. But we're working with CI login right now, which is uh, kind of an uh, IAM instance, um, hosted an IAM instance. Um, they they support this kind of thing. So we're moving that kind of uh, mapping to the cloud. 
Um, we also have a number of GPUs in our in our cluster, and we support um, running both interactive and batch jobs on those GPUs based on given certain authorization rights. Uh, I'm not going to go through all this. This is kind of a our architecture diagram. Uh, these are I know they're not easy to pick up when, at first glance, but just uh, briefly, um, this is the kind of project release manner I mentioned earlier, the one who builds containers. Uh, can you see my mouse, by the way, my cursor? Okay, that's good. Uh, they're the one that it builds containers and pushes it to the, the image registry. Um, we have the admin, sorry, the admin I mentioned who will do the group management and, and things like this. And, but here's our science users. So they get a list of the images, the Docker images that are available on the platform or from the different Im image registries to support. They then launch interactive or batch sessions, which end up down here on the Kubernetes cluster. And the only difference between batch job and the inter interactive jobs is that there's an ingress to the browser experience that the users have. Um, this all runs on Kubernetes with Q installed. Uh, but another uh, key factor in this is that all the interactive and batch sessions have a consistent um, mounting strategy for different storage systems. So we support user storage uh, here. Uh, so it, no matter what they're running, they have their own persistent home directories and things like this. We can support CBMFS for uh, runtime installation of software. Um, we could mount SKA data, for example. These are just examples that I came up with. You can add these arbitrary mounts on your deployment of Canfor. Uh, this is just an example uh, of what our the user looks like. This is our portal page where the user has logged in and they have three different sessions running, which they can connect to. We can launch different ones here with just a simple set of options um, and just a, a little peek at what the cluster is like. We're looking at improving this in the near future to, to be able to display the queues that are uh, in the cluster right now. And this is one of the interactive sessions called Carta. Um, and just near the end here, um, we, I don't think I'm gonna get into this, but we, we just thinking about our architecture in general, how we can continue to be cloud native and make improvements. And yes, that's all I have. And here's some of the, the groups that have contributed to this. So thanks for letting me share this. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, it looks it looks great. Maybe maybe we can use this. Uh, I don't know if other people have questions, uh, but if you can share the slide where you had the stack, uh, sure. Because maybe maybe the, this is a good starting point to see what what kind of information people would be interested on. Oh, sorry, let's go back here. Yeah, down, down. Yeah, because for example, um, if we talk about let, let's take identity uh, here, it says like Open ID Connect, I am Group Authority, Group Membership. But maybe for each of these blocks, what would be interesting is like what, what kind of solution did you choose to use uh, behind it? I, I guess if you would be using like a public cloud provider, it would be whatever they have. But uh, for on-premises deployments, maybe you're using like Keycloak or uh, some other type of solution for for the um, SSO and identity man management, and maybe similar things for group management. Mm -hmm. is, is is this the kind of information that we would like? From uh, from my point of view, this is the kind of thing that uh, would be really interesting. Sure. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to detail that. We've had the, the AI components of the system have been really complicated to figure out, try to figure out the right roadmap to yep. um, be able to interrupt with other interoperate with other groups. Um, I think we have a pretty good one right now. Um, we had considered using Keycloak because we are ourselves an open ID connect identity provider. We have our own local groups, but we kind of want to get out of that business because uh, we want to focus on astronomy and so instead of adopting key cloak to manage that set of users going forward we decided to move uh into the cloud i mentioned ci logon is in our plans and so we're initially going to move our the support of our open id connect user base into the cloud through ci logon 
This is, and this is going to allow us to interoperate, federate with other identity providers, including the SKA IAM instance. And so the federation's not going to happen at the local node level, which we are residing, but in the in the cloud at the IAM level, uh, CI login and the other IAMs that we will collaborate with. It's not just SKA. There's other large telescopes we're working with are going to federate in that in that way. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know, just to, your reply is exactly the kind of context that would be very useful for anyone looking uh, at this kind of report. Uh, if there's a stack saying like CI Logan, it's one thing. If, if it, there's a stack and there's also some context on other things that were evaluated and some mm -hmm. reasoning of why people, something else was tried, uh, this is very valuable information. So when, when I was mentioning to have like the stack, but also the context. I think this was uh, was exactly the case. And if we would go into the different uh, uh, like blocks here, I'm sure very similar questions would be uh, right. asked. Like the image registry, what are you using? Are you using like a, a public cloud one, or are you deploying your own? Which kind? Uh, what was the reasoning? Things like this. Yeah. So I think. Okay. We can go in detail in, in each of these uh, items uh, in, in the different replies. I'm sure, sure. we'll have sure. some more questions, I'm assuming. No. Um, so are you suggesting we do that now or? In no, 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 no. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. No, I, I was actually suggesting that we do this offline, but uh, that yeah, in, yeah, the, in the questionnaire, yeah, exactly. In the document, in the questionnaire that we want yeah. everyone to kind of reply, that we ask these questions uh, and yeah. that we, if this is the kind of like content that people would expect from, from the replies. So I have a deck I've been preparing for EGI in a couple of weeks. Um, I don't know if anyone else is going, um, but uh, that I can, it's probably a bit long to do the full thing, but I can quickly blast through some of the slides on that if you want some more context from an in from an infrastructure side about what we do, because we OpenStack is also a key component for us. So, um, but I think I think what, what I would like to come from today, like we can we can have individual sessions then from from the different replies, but. Um, the outcome of today would be to to really have. Uh, a good idea of the kind of content people expect from 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 each other, um, and like we heard a lot, like uh, we, we heard a lot about, especially the networking stack for next generation HPC centers and things like this. Um, and I don't know the, the answer that Brian gave for the IDP part is also extremely interesting. So the other the other thing we have is uh, we've developed a Kubernetes a performance testing framework for Kubernetes that can do things like um, easily run we, so we can run parameter sweeps for iperf and things like that and um, across different network interfaces on pods. Um, and we can also do some reference application benchmarks in there. So I think we've got things like open foam for MPI and um, and things like and some and we've got a Py, the PyTorch micro benchmarks in there for trying to stress the GPUs and make sure they're working. So I wondered if people were interested in that as well. So. There's a whole bunch of interesting subjects in there, Matt. So. It's the, the whole question of, well, how do you prove that your cluster is behaving correctly? Yeah. What 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 benchmarks do you run? What conform yeah, exactly. compliance tests do you run? So the reason so, I mean we, we use we use the SIG group um Sona Boy test suite yeah. as a starting point as an example. The reason we developed this operator is precisely for what you say. So we can define a set of tests as YAML files and then run them everywhere. So um, we've got an operator that has CRDs to, that represents these different tests. And um, you can obviously write your tests in uh, in YAML and put them in Git, uh, Git and and you're exactly right. So the, there's a number of reasons why you'd want to run benchmarking. It's so you know, you, does my hardware work? Does it perform like the vendor said it should? Um, 
if I'm using virtualization, what's the impact of that? What's the impact of my networking configuration? You know, all those different kinds of things that you can evaluate. Um, and I, even as an application developer, I think it's useful because you you can use the these kind of synthetic benchmarks to establish a maximum performance that you could expect from your application. And then you, when when you're not getting there, you can you have an idea where to look to start figuring out why. It's you know what I mean. So um, I think it might be quite that could be quite useful. So. Um, Okay, so this this would be like uh, asking to list other tools in addition to the core infrastructure stack, other yeah. tools that are important in the kind of day to day operations, supporting users, uh, validating clusters, things like this. I can share a link to a YouTube to, to, on YouTube to a talk that we did a, a to a talk that I did with a colleague at a Kubernetes workshop in the UK. Um, if people okay. are interested about this testing framework. So. Yeah, I'm also trying to take some notes on the basic questions we had at the beginning on how people could consider expanding uh, the replies and, and then we can reorganize things a bit. I'm definitely I'm definitely interested to see who who cares where the Kubernetes cluster comes from, because um, whether you know whether it's bare metal or vert or and whether you want to be in control of the kubernetes deployment or whether you're happy to to take advantage of whatever the public cloud providers have or you know um, those kind of things are interesting to me because if you're trying to make a kubernetes cluster that's good for hpc um there's a whole bunch of decisions that you have to make um that you might not necessarily get control of in a public cloud provider's Kubernetes distribution. Thanks. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking these notes as well. And I think once we have this, people will start expanding. And um, I would also like to know who has who who's running on prem and who's running in public clouds. Yeah. Like that's all. And whether that whether bursting is a thing that people do or and how they're doing that. Yeah. yeah the storage is interesting to me as well that's i mean we have a similar problem with the uid space um, that, that you were talking about brian so um when you've got users that come from oidc they don't come with a unix uid associated with them usually so <laughs> you have to work out what that looks like on your system yeah exactly and you also have to um uh deal with the possible duplication between the idps exactly so it's a very tricky problem um, but, but I, I i understand that it's we're not the first ones to encounter it and ci login does have some features that support that so. yeah the so ci logon is um like an academic federation right yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah how does it do you know how it compares to something like my access id which is what we have in the uk is i think that's um, a, that's um so in my access id is run by jayont which is like um uh yeah so they do they also have um they have another cloud offering uh, uh i can't remember the name now but i i think it's very similar to that where yeah. They they don't actually hold passwords themselves. They're a proxy to the different IDPs, but they also uh, assemble information about the groups. And yeah, that's, like that's the, definitely the, how yeah. my access ID is working. So yeah. you know, all the a bunch, the universities all sign up to it, and there are like when you go, you can do a delegated sign in through my access ID from your university. Mm -hmm. But the, the the service only has to talk to my access ID, like you say. It's like um, an uh, like an uh, an identity proxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, well, one of the core design decisions that we struggled with, and we think we're on the right path, is like, what what is the role of Kubernetes users in this landscape? So at this point, we've only used system accounts to uh, interact with Kubernetes, and we're afraid to you know move our users right down into the Kubernetes layer, except for in the containers themselves and which reflects on the storage, which they interact with. But um, we, we don't really want to expose those. But then you have to wonder how you get some of the benefits of 
the RBAC support and stuff like that yeah. out of Kubernetes, yeah. if you know. So yeah. the okay. issues with multi-tenancy in Kubernetes, right? Yeah. So. yeah. So we had presentations in the past also where people were giving details of how they are converting credentials as well. Like uh, the users will come like in a notebook using whatever OAuth2 credentials uh, tokens coming from some some endpoints and then they have to convert those to local credentials to access storage uh, systems. And all this process is also something that would be very useful to, to uh, kind of... I'm not aware of... Uh standard for doing that yeah yeah be. so maybe think, like by listening to all the things people are doing uh, we'll... it's like a lot of the time it, it ends up being i'm going to look up the preferred username in my ldap database and use the uid from there which is a bit a bit crappy right but, um... yeah, but for example internally we we actually got some of our storage systems to start supporting OAuth. in, the, in those cases we can just yeah 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 like, to a token exchange, things like this. So it, it really depends on the back end as well. So yeah, of course. Uh, one like we have two uh, a couple of minutes left. So one one thing is uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask everyone what, what should we aim for uh, as output of this? Uh, like I, I guess do, are we aiming for a single reference architecture for? like research workloads, or are we aiming to collect from each end user uh, their uh, data and then somehow uh, expose this to everyone as independent ones from each end user? I, I, I think we might not know what that looks like until we kind of unpack some of the use cases. So if, if, if for instance, if I look at the, the current use cases that we have within the SKA, um, I don't have, you know, the luxury of what Brian has of being able to hold users off um, at arm's length with system accounts because all they get access to is a is an end user service. Because we're building telescopes and we have multiple vendors and they require access to the platform even down to the hardware level, we have to give them. API access, but also shell account access to the underlying hardware in some instances as well, which are actually part of the cluster. So there's, you know, different models attacking those problems are going to, you know, going to come up with different answers, um, you know, depending on what your environment is that you're operating in. Yeah, I guess I guess my question was more like, is it realistic to have one architect, one reference architecture that says if you're looking for this kind of thing, look into this, or we just say, like, browse through everyone's replies and find what best suits your use case. It feels to me like a single reference architecture is probably what um, optimistic. Um, I think yeah. we should start by gathering people's responses and seeing if there's best practice yeah. that we can extract from that, um, rather than saying this is an, a reference architecture, um, yeah. and then go from there. I would I would suggest. So the reason I asked this, I will paste the link. There is another effort. Uh, it's called Knoe. In case you haven't heard of it, uh, I will put the link in the chat. And this is uh, basically, it's an effort that I started, if I'm not completely wrong, in AWS. But they are trying to do one single reference architecture for the whole cloud native area. Uh, but of course, like it has the problems that we all uh, discussed here, which is extremely dependent on use case. Uh, so that, but I wanted to put it out there, uh, just, uh, just, uh, uh, and it will disappear into the, you know, you know whether this is going to be proprietary software and extensions that you're going to be rely on, and your and whether or not you're happy to pay for that. Yeah. Um, you know what, what's your life cycle turnover of your platform and the software and components within it? You know, do you, are you needing to build something for the next, you know, ten years or twenty years or fifty years, in some cases? 
um, and will have strict refresh timetables. Yeah. Yeah, I also added in the details for for things in the replies, like to say to make it more explicit if people are using the open source versions of the projects or if it's like some vendor specific with some additional functionality that is not available in the open source one because this is kind of a common thing that this works for me but actually I'm using this with the, the three extra features that come with this vendor specific flavor. Yeah. I, I think um, one important aspect of this kind of building on what Piers was saying is that when we're submitting our responses to these questions about architecture, we have to clearly identify what user community we're trying to um, address. Who are our clients, right? It's a different group that Paris has than, than I have and that each of us has. So by identifying the context of what you're trying to build, what the users are trying to do, will really put the, um, you'll be able to start layering those architectures together perhaps into something that might look like a single architecture with different options. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're running out of time, so I'll cut it here, but uh, I, I took a bunch of notes. Uh, I will, the next step, I will share this to Google Doc. Uh, we can maybe iterate offline just by commenting, editing, uh, suggesting things. And when we feel we have something stable, we, we can start filling it up, uh, each one uh, on our sides. And I will also suggest that the next meeting we we take the same topic because I think if we if we just push this forward in the next couple of weeks we'll probably get to a nice place by sometime end of October or something. Uh, so if everyone agrees, then I'll just put a part two on on this topic for the next uh, session. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it opens up interesting other discussions. So yeah, that's it's a good one. Cool. Thank you very okay. much for attending then, and we'll follow it up offline. Thanks, Brian, for the for the presentation as well. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank nice you. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah.